Well, good morning. Let's try that again. It's a holiday weekend. Good morning. It's so good to be together, both upstairs and downstairs and online. I'm so grateful about that. Uh, the Lord has given us a place to meet. And I, I just was reflecting on this last song that we were just singing and, and uh, celebrating not only the reckless love, but really the scandalous, unbelievable, overwhelming, the love of God, what he would do for us, if that doesn't bring you to a place of thankfulness and gratitude, then we have missed it. And so I am so uh, grateful to be drawn into what Jesus has done for us this morning, and I hope you are as well. Uh, let me just begin with this. Uh, if you have, and you may be watching online, again, if you're online and uh, I'm looking right, uh, what, one of the cameras I'm looking at, and just saying, if Facebook has some kind of issue, which it does, harvestlivestream.com, harvestlivestream.com, uh, that is uh, a stable place for you to go to to catch the service, and then I want to alert you to using the app, uh, in fact, if you have a, a phone right now, would you just get that out, or a tablet, whatever you're doing, and uh, turn to the app that is Harvest Church Sela, and you can go ahead and fill out your connect card this morning. We'd love to connect with you in this way. And you say, well, didn't we used to hand out Connect cards? Didn't we used to do that? We did. Way back, remember way back in February? In March, I think that was this year. And uh, you can do this now uh, right through the app. And we'd love for you to do that so we can pray for you by name. We'd love to pray for you by name this week. Uh, we invite you to do that. And then we'd invite you to uh, help us uh, stay on mission. And that is through your generosity a number of ways to give through the app, through the website, a giving box by the back door. Uh, we just appreciate your generosity. But <clears throat> before we go any further this morning, today we have a, a, a great opportunity that just brings the scripture to life for us. Uh, we are able to have a good friend of Harvest here with us, and I want to introduce you to Brent. Brent, uh, I'm going to ask you to come up. Uh, Brent, come and join us and grab this microphone if you would. Brent is a dear friend of us at Harvest, and you're like, I'm not sure I've seen Brent recently. No, you haven't. You haven't seen Brent recently because Brent serves the Egyptian Christians and who wants, and he wants everyone to experience the love of Christ. He lives and works in Egypt. Isn't that uh, just so good as we open our Bibles and we read about uh, what God did and is doing great things there? He uh, owns a business. He provides opportunities and income for people in the city of Cairo. And would you just please welcome Brent this morning? Would you do that? <laughs> and so, uh, Brent, I'm just going to ask. Yep. I, is he on? Is he good? Good. All right. Okay. Brent, uh, we have been learning from the life of Moses. We've been in the book of Exodus, and we've been learning and gleaning so much truth about what God did in this particular place, but you know this particular place. You live in this particular place. And so we're just uh, grateful because sometimes when we read it, we say, is that really real? Is that even, uh, is it really a place? Uh, and would you tell us and just bring to us uh, what you're experiencing, uh, the reality of living and working in this part of the world? Brent, just share with us what God is doing around you. Thank you, uh, Pastor Jason. I'm just going to hang uh, out here, so I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> okay, please, you, you bring yeah. me comfort. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, good morning. Um, I, uh, I, I hope you all have had a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend, and um, as uh, Pastor Jason mentioned, um, I have thought a lot about um, history, and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and he... It, in a sense, yeah, it's it, living in Egypt uh, does open your eyes to things from Scripture, but uh, in a, in another sense, the miracle of faith is a miracle that um, he gives to people here that he doesn't give to Egypt to people in Egypt and um, and vice versa. Yeah. And so the miracle of faith is it is a, a thing that surpasses history and location and everything. Somehow we end up believing in Jesus. And um, it's his amazing, amazing work, uh, mm -hmm. uh, miraculous. But um, so uh, this long 
Thanksgiving weekend. I've pondered history quite a bit in preparation for uh, being with you this morning. And of course, each of us has a different history. Uh, my history includes uh, parents who graduated from Sela High School. Uh -huh. um, I grew up in Yakima, but uh, as Pastor Jason mentioned now, almost half my life has been living in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, I do have a business that gives me an opportunity to give a little income to some people. And in our business, we love to just live and share uh, the love of Jesus, and, um, as do many, many of our brothers and sisters in Egypt. So, um, I, But I was thinking about history, and I wanted to see what Google said about history. So I typed in history of, and uh, the first nine offerings of Google is history of Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. uh, history of Walla Walla. Um, <laughs> that seemed... Sort of random, not totally random, but um, yeah. uh, history of the world, Pasco, Washington, Washington State, the Confederate flag, Mexico, India, Japan. And these were just the first nine offerings out of seven billion links uh, that, that Google offers for history of. And uh, I don't know about you, but for me in this world of information overload and so many seemingly disconnected random facts. I like to remember that history is his story. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the yeah. story uh, of God's um, full on, constant, full throttle love for an obstinate, stubborn human race. Yes. Uh, that's yeah. history. Yeah. And, that's uh, right. and he uses it all to mm -hmm. do his best to maybe some of us will uh, listen to him and know him. Uh, so I I, I I am going to touch on the Exodus, yeah. and then um, actually my focus this time is the f the, the early church, mm -hmm. the first centuries of Christianity, and then I'll mention briefly what I see God doing in Egypt. Uh, uh, but first of all, the Exodus. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I I've thought a lot about it. Uh, the Exodus as I've traveled around the Delta and the Nile Delta and then across the Suez Canal and into Sinai and Mount Sinai and um, I've taken some courses in archaeology that are related to the Exodus and it's fascinating but um, I think the biggest problem for the Pharaohs is that they had um, impossible expectations of them uh, Pharaoh, of course, was viewed as God, and so he was required to provide things that only God can provide, and that's a problem for a human being. Yes. Um, yes. And um, yeah. so, uh, for example, among the things that were expected of mm -hmm. Pharaoh was that he provide a constant flow of clean water in the Nile. Another thing that he was required to provide is every year, every harvest, the harvest be healthy. Uh, Pharaoh was even expected and required every morning to bring light out of darkness. Well, of course, the Exodus provided a wonderful example for yeah. God uh, to show how miserably even Pharaoh can fail in providing these things. Yeah. And so the Exodus, uh, like all of history, was an opportunity for Pharaoh and the people of uh, Egypt to know, and they could no longer claim that they don't know Yahweh. Mm -hmm. uh, so isn't that wonderful that um, the plagues in our lives are also opportunities to know mm -hmm. our Creator? Uh, if we fast forward 1400 years, we come to the beginning of the church. And uh, Egyptians were present at the day of Pentecost. And so the Egyptians there in Acts chapter 2, when they left Jerusalem and went back to Egypt, they brought the Christian faith with them. But the problem for Christians in Egypt, mm -hmm. uh, like the problem for Christians all around the Roman Empire at the time, was that they lived among a people, most of whom were really quite happy and content with this contradictory Roman way of sort of accepting and even promoting anything and everything. Mm -hmm. It's like the important thing is just like say everything's okay. And, mm -hmm. of course, that's contradictory. And um, that's the reason that a, uh, a, a professor of uh, church history at Denver Seminary wrote that to the Roman, the Christian seemed utterly intolerant and insanely stubborn. Um, 
And isn't it amazing how history repeats itself? <laughs> um, and the reason he said this was because the Christians, they were so unreasonable. They refused to sacrifice to the emperor and things like that. And there was an early Roman historian named uh, Publius Cornelius Tacitus. Tacitus was about 30 years old when John wrote the book of Revelation. And uh, Tacitus wrote about Christians that they show hatred of the human race. Why? Because they didn't agree and accept and promote everything that most people thought were was reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, thus, they hated the human race. Uh, and um, so that was the, peop the, the opinion of, of most people in the first couple of centuries. But the, the interesting thing is that the emperors, for the first couple of centuries, they really didn't care what Christians believed. They didn't really care what anybody believed as long as they had power. Yeah. And, um, and, but it was in the third century uh, AD that the emperors finally began to wake up to the fact that uh, Christi Christianity is a serious threat to them holding on to their power. And uh, when Diocletian became emperor in 284 AD, he began to systematically remove Christians from uh, positions of influence, mm -hmm. from the army, uh, from the public service, and at the same time, Diocletian surrounded himself with uh, government officials who were openly opposed to Christianity. Mm. Uh, at this, but, but at the same time, Christians all over the Roman Empire were willing to suffer martyrdom, to be, to be killed for their faith. And at the same time, many non-Christians in the third century no longer believed the many slanderous things that were said against Christians, many of which were completely untrue. And you know what? Christians had proved by their lives that a lot of what was said against them simply wasn't true. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, in a desperate attempt, Diocletian, right at the end of his reign, ordered that um, thousands of Christian leaders be executed, thousands more imprisoned, and many countless thousands of so-called Christians turned away from the faith. Um, this was his desperate attempt to bring an end to Christianity. Um, and uh, in 305 AD, Diocletian retired. And it seems that Diocletian, when he retired, sat back and enjoyed the belief that Christianity was in its final throes. Mm -hmm. And from a public worldly perspective it was but that's the miracle of faith isn't it and we can look back with I in history uh, with much clearer uh, clearer hindsight about what happened and we know that no matter what the emperors no matter what the people threw at christians our faith their faith held firm and it will continue to to, to hold firm not because of us but because of the one who is in us and um, the amazing thing is that it was only eight years later that the emperor, now Constantine, he realized, you know what? I'm going to um, be um, uh, destroying myself and my reign if I keep trying to eliminate Christianity. Because he realized there is no eliminating Christianity. There is no eliminating Christianity. Mm -hmm. And so he concluded, you know, the best thing I can do politically is make it legal. And um, thus, uh, in 313 AD, he uh, issued the Edict of Milan, which was the first legalization of Christianity in the Roman Empire. Um, so fast forward again to today in Egypt. Um, mm -hmm. One of the amazing things about the faith of Egyptian mm -hmm. Christians is that it looks so much like the faith of the early church. Um, uh, Egyptian Christians have learned uh, to have a faith that is very courageous, but at the same time very wise. And I think the thing that impresses me most about the faith uh, of the millions of, of Christians in Egypt today is that they have a really keen discernment of which battles are important enough to fight. Um, and, but at the same time, they are not afraid they are not afraid, and they are fully prepared to lose everything they have in this world uh, for their faith in Jesus. So that's mm -hmm. my prayer for yeah. us. 
yeah. uh, for Christians everywhere in the world is that we would experience the yeah. full liberty of being prepared, if necessary, to lose everything we have in this world because yeah. greater is the one that is in us than all the power the prince of this world can muster against us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Brent, just hold on to that for a second. Uh, we're going to pray right now that we would experience not just a local uh, movement of God, not just a regional movement of God in powerful ways, but a global movement of God that he would be touching life after life after life, despite hardship, despite adversity. And I'm going to ask you to pray right now uh, for Christians in Egypt and across the world, that God would be doing great things and among us this morning as well. Would you just pray with me? Would you just extend a hand? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come to you and we know that the whole world belongs to you. There's no one greater than you. No emperor could wipe out what you have caused to be in motion. Your people around the world gather in your name, and we pray. We pray for Christians in Egypt. We pray for Christians in America. We pray for Christians in every corner of this globe, that you would do great and mighty things Bring people to yourself. Bring people who have hard hearts towards you. Soften them, Jesus. And we pray that as we think about who you are and what you've done, that we can rest in the fact that you're in control of it all. All praise to the name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 Would you thank Brent for being with us this morning? <laughs> Brent, thank you so much. Uh, I, I love that we can celebrate that our God is not a just a localized God. He's not a God of a certain time period and then his time is over. He is the God of the whole world. In fact, we're celebrating the power of God this morning. That's the title of the message. If you have a Bible this morning, would you take it out? We're going to be in that second book of the Bible again this week, the book of Exodus and as we turn to that, we'll be in Exodus 9. If you're using the app, it's there for you. Uh, you can see it. And we would love uh, for you to understand that we're looking at our God who is powerful. I love as we look at history and we see our God is greater than anything that can be thrown at him. Any hardship, any difficulty, any leader who says, nope, I don't want that. And we're going to witness that very thing happen in the book of Exodus. But I want you to think about power. Power, uh, what comes to your mind when you think about power? Last week we gave you a couple of pictures. This week I want to give you the picture of a tiger. And if you have ever uh, witnessed the power uh, of a large cat, uh, you want to be clear that you're on the other side of the glass from the large cat. Would you agree? Uh, this summer, as we were hiking, Christy and I were hiking uh, near Cleelum. We were coming down this, this uh, trail, and a hundred yards in front of us, a cougar came out onto the trail. And I'm going to tell you, even now, little goosebumps on my arm, because we stopped, and the cat stopped, and then the cat darted away, and then we <laughs> darted away. We were like, oh, let's go investigate that. I wonder if the power of those teeth really are that sharp. You know, let's see what the, the compression power is. No, we understand the power of the tiger. How about this power of electrical lines? It, if you know anything about the power of electricity, don't mess with it. Are you, are you sure about this? There were some huge electrical lines uh, that were near where my parents live. And there was a farm uh, that was there that uh, they were milking cows. And the electrical lines, when they got installed, caused the cows to stop milking. And uh, the, the, the farmer had to sue the electrical company, won the battle, and said, it's the power of the electrical lines that have caused my farm to go under. None of the cows that previously produced a lot of milk, 
they will no longer produce milk because of these electrical lines. And they said, yep, that's true. That is one of the things that happens. And so you're, right now you're thinking, where do I live? How close do I live towards electrical lines? Should I get a cow? Should I do that? Today we're going to think about this. Visible displays of power recorded for us in the book of Exodus. And we're going to witness the uh, remaining plagues. And you're like, man, that doesn't sound happy. It's not about the plagues. That should not be our focus. The plagues simply draw our attention to the power of God. You see, the plagues were both great and terrible. To witness them is to be brought into a place of awe because of the power that is displayed. But to be under the plagues is to suffer and to hurt and to have hardship. And so we want to understand well the power of God this morning. And so if you have your Bible open, Exodus chapter 9, verses 13 through 16. Here's what it says. Then the Lord said to Moses, rise up early in the morning and present yourself before Pharaoh. You've seen this a couple of times now. And say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, let my people, anybody? Let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you yourself and on your servants and on your people so that you may know that there is none like me in all the earth. Would you underline that in your Bible? Because that is important. So that you would know that there is none like me in all the earth. For by now I could have put out my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence. And you would have been cut off from the earth. But for this purpose, verse 16, very important now. But for this purpose, I have raised you up to show you my power. So that by my power, so that by my name, you, my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Let me read that again because I, I just didn't feel like I did it justice. But for this purpose, I have raised you up, Pharaoh, to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. As we read this, we recognize that what we hold in our hands, what, what we come to is not just a, a little uh, part of a story. It's not just uh, history of some place at some time, but this really is the word of God for us. Amen. Amen. As we look at this, I want you to see from plague number seven, the plague of hail, the plague of hail. It is really a declaration of war. You're going to see this again and again, that God was declaring war against false gods, gods that claim power. And today we see it's a declaration of war against Seth. And Seth, who's ushering for us, Seth, this is no, no personal conviction against you, all right? You, know, just, you happen to share the same name as Seth, the god of the crops. God is declaring war against Seth, god of the crops, and against, uh, and her name is Newt, not Nut. Newt, goddess of the sky. I make sure I go and say, how do you say that? How do you say that? And I listen to it. Uh, and I listen to it on Google. How do you say that? Newt. Okay goddess of the sky. So God is going to declare war in this next plague. But I love that he shows you and he declares with absolute certainty, this is why I am doing what I'm doing. Know the purpose of the plagues. God wants his power to be acknowledged. He wants his power to be acknowledged. He said this, if I wanted to wipe you from the face of the earth, I could have unleashed a pestilence. I could have unleashed disease and I could have just wiped you out. But that's not my heart. That's not my plan. It's not my purpose. It's not what I want. What I want is that you would recognize who I am. What I want is I want my name to be declared and proclaimed in all the earth. And this isn't new. This has always been the plan. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1, if you go uh, see Genesis 1 and 2 together, you will see that God had a plan. And his plan was to fill the earth. His plan was to fill the earth and that every part of this earth would reflect him. That's why he wanted image bearers, people. And every 
portion of this world so that all of this earth, like a sparkling disco ball, hanging out there in space, would proclaim the name of Jesus, would reflect him well. It's been his plan all along. It's him coming through on that plan, even through things like plagues, that people would see who he is. God wants his power to be acknowledged. God wants his name to be proclaimed. That's why I had to back up and say, I didn't read that verse well. I want to read it with clarity. I want you to see it. I want you to see it clearly that God spoke his purpose for the plagues in such a way that you and I would know what he was doing. God wants his name to be proclaimed. I love that as we move toward Christmas time, I love as uh, we move into this season that the angels proclaimed on the night of Jesus' birth, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, there should be nowhere that his glory isn't being displayed. There should be nowhere where his name is not proclaimed. We want that for the whole world. We want that. And God wants that. He wants it for your street. He wants it for your family. He wants it for your neighborhood. He wants it for our county. He wants it for the furthest reaches, the farthest place from here that you could imagine. He wants that. And every heart. He wants his name to be proclaimed. What does God want for you? What does God want for each of us? That his power would be made known to us and in us and then through us. First to us, then in us, then through us. That's what he wants. If you notice what happens next, God will tell the Pharaoh through Moses and Aaron to get any of the animals and servants, anything that is outside and exposed, get them to a place of shelter. Even if you have to bring animals into your home, bring them in because I'm about to unleash a powerful plague, a plague of destructive hail. Get everything in. God is warning them, telling them what to do. He's saying, do this, do this quickly. And then you read this. Look all the way down to verse 24 of chapter nine with me. It says this, there was hail and fire flashing continually in the midst of the hail. So this is not just a, a, a gentle little like, oh, isn't that pleasant? It's like snow. This is not like snow. There was hail and there's flashing continually in the midst of the hail, very heavy hail, such as had never been in all the land of Egypt since it became a nation. In fact, I would think about this, maybe Brent, uh, uh, how many times have you experienced hail in your years there? Tons and tons? None. It's not common that it's the wrong place just geographically for hail. It just, it's not a common occurrence. This is supernatural. It became a nation. The hail struck down everything that was in the field in all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. The hail struck down every plant of the field and broke every tree of the field only in the land of Goshen. Now note this, only in the land of Goshen where the people of Israel were, was there no hail? As we read that, I want you to realize that there is a protection and there is a peace that only God can provide for the people of God. And if this strikes you, if that strikes you as unfair, it is absolutely unfair. Sometimes as you read the Bible, you say, that feels, that feels a little unfair. It's not that it just feels that way, it's because it is that way. And I'm gonna tell you this, un, uh, that fairness is overrated in our world. It is. What you want more than fairness is you desire mercy. And what you desire truly greater than mercy is God's grace. And so if this strikes you as unfair, just recognize that it is unfair. It is justice and mercy and even the taste of grace as God is working powerfully in this account. Look at verse 27 with me. Then Pharaoh sent and called Moses and Aaron and said to them, this time I have sinned. Would you circle this time? This time I have sinned. The Lord is right, is in the right, and I and my people are in the wrong. Plead with the Lord, for there has been enough of God's thunder and hail. 
I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. Moses said to him, as soon as I have gone out from the city, I will stretch out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease, and there will be no more hail, so that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord God. The flax and the barley were struck down, for the barley was in the ear and the flax was in the bud, but the wheat and the emmer were not struck down, for they are late in coming up. That's the, they're another season yet to come. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and stretched out his hands to the Lord, and the thunder and the hail ceased. The rain no longer poured upon the earth, but when the Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart, he and his servants. When the pressure is off, when the suffering has relented, again, there is a return. But as you read this, you, you, you say, hey, this is, this is sounding like we're going in the right direc uh, direction here. It's about, is the tide about to turn? The Pharaoh would say that I have sinned. And that's why you have to come back and say, note the key there. This time, this time I sinned. And some of you say, we, we need a little definition of what sin is. And I'm going to give you just a, a simple definition of sin. Sin is anything that we think or say or do that is against the person and character of God. Anything that we would think or say or do that is against the person and character of God. And what you're witnessing here is that the Pharaoh is saying, this time I may have got it wrong. But before now, I got it right. And so there is, there is this heart check of saying, is this true repentance? Is this truly uh, an admit uh, where the Pharaoh is admitting that he has sin and that he has done what is wrong? And is he admitting who God is? And what we discover here is that this is not repentance. Repentance is not just words. This is for us now, not for the Pharaoh. Repentance is not just words. It is real change. Because somebody can say to you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and not change. Is that repentance, yes or no? No. Repentance is not just words. It is real change. And we're in plague number seven here, the power of God on display for the seventh time in a, a, an amazing, miraculous way. But the Pharaoh is saying, I haven't sinned up till now, but this time I might have got it wrong. And you ask, what about the abuse of the Israelite people for hundreds of years? Is that not sin? And I, I would say this for us, and this is just a, something I would like you to write down and come and study it on your own, but for the sake of time, I'm not able to go there today. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 through 10, where it talks about two different kinds of sorrow that happen in a person's heart. One is called godly grief or godly sorrow. And it says this in 2 Corinthians 7, godly sorrow will lead to repentance, real change. Real change. Not just, I feel bad. And then there is another type of sorrow, another type of grief that enters a person's heart. And this is far more common. There is what we call worldly grief. Worldly grief says, I feel bad about that. I feel bad I got caught. I feel bad that you found out about what I've been thinking or saying or doing. I feel bad about that. I feel, I, I might even have tears. I might have emotion, but it doesn't bring any change. Godly grief brings change. Worldly grief brings, oops, I got caught. And that's where we see, even in this account, that the Pharaoh is saying, I feel bad because we're suffering. I feel bad about that. But it's not the change of heart. And that's where we come back and say, how do you know that? How do you know that? Because when we come back to verse 34, when the Pharaoh saw that the rain and hail and thunder had ceased, he sinned yet again and hardened his heart. Saying that's over, we're done with that. I feel bad for the damage and the people who suffered. 
moving on. What the Pharaoh does here is he, he suggests compromise. He wants to make a deal. He wants to negotiate with the Lord. The Lord does not want compromise. He does not want deals. He does not want negotiation. What he wants, and he's already stated that very clearly in his purposes, I want acknowledgement. I want glory. I want honor. I want freedom. I want proclamation of my name in all the earth. I want my power to be made known to you, in you, and through you. Look at what happens next. Plague number eight is locusts. A declaration of war against Isis, god of life, goddess of life. And Seth, again, protector of the crops. God is going to say, remember those crops that had not come up yet? Now they have come up. Now they have surfaced. In fact, as you look at this, some of you think that all of these plagues happened in like a span of a week. Most theologians think they happened over the span of nine months, allowing another crop to come up following the hail. And then the plague of locusts. Look at what it says in chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his serpents, servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that, that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians, and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord." Here's what he is saying to Moses. I want you to be able to tell your kids. I want you to be able to tell your grandkids about my power on display. I want you to pass down who I am and what I've done to another generation. I want that for you. And so I'm going to put this on display. Look at verses 7 through 11. Then Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long after they are being decimated by locusts and ready for that next uh, power display of God. Then Pharaoh's servant said to him, how long shall this man be a snare to us? Talking of Moses, let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh and he said to them, go serve the Lord your God. But which ones are to go? Moses said, we will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. But he said to them, The Lord be with you. If ever I let you go and your little ones go, look, you have some evil purpose in mind. No. Go the men among you and serve the Lord, for that is what you are asking. And they were driven out from the Pharaoh's presence. He's going to make a deal with them. He's going to say, oh, 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 I'll let the men go. Compromise. Compromise. And the Lord is saying no. And I want you to hold on to this today. Trying to make a deal with God is to dishonor him. And if I asked for a show of hands, I would say that many of us, we try to make deals with God often. God, if you'll just do this for me, then I will. Hold on to this truth. Partial obedience is disobedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. God has spoken clearly. He has told the Pharaoh what he wants. He's spoken clearly to us. He's, he's communicated what he wants. And when we say, I'll do this for you. Partial obedience is disobedience. And so God unleashes locusts on the land. I don't know if you have a picture in your mind of locusts, but this is a picture I have in my mind of locusts, is that uh, when I was in Honduras, uh, leading a team of students there, and I was in this one town, uh, and uh, they said, hey, go invite all of the neighborhood kids and uh, invite them to come, and we're going to put on a big kids uh, program and uh, we're going to go just around uh, street to street town uh, not town to town but around that whole area and invite kids and I went with somebody who spoke Spanish much better than I and we went house to house and we were inviting kids and I remember this one little kid coming out and he had a locust on a leash <laughs> the head of it was that big around 
and it was this long. And he had it on a leash, and he was walking it down. And I thought, what is that? That is crazy. And uh, they were like, this is a locust. Yeah, it's a locust. And I was like, I thought, Exodus. <laughs> Exodus. That is gigantic, the power of that. And as I was looking for a picture to put up for you today, uh, I typed in the word locust. Same thing, Brent, same thing. I typed in the word locust, and up came this acknowledgement from the World Bank. And I'm like, I wasn't looking for this. And it said, the locust crisis of 2020. And multiple places around the world this year, locusts have been multiplying and destroying crops at unimaginable numbers on every continent. And uh, they were, the World Bank was issuing, saying, this is a problem and we don't know what to do about it. And it brought me back to say, God, you're greater than all. You're greater than locusts. You're greater than hail. You're greater than all the things that we see. And you're greater than even what we will witness next, which is darkness. 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 Plague number nine is darkness. A declaration of war against the sun god, Ra. Against the one who is declared to bring the sun out from its tent every morning. The one who is supposedly in charge. And if you read verses 21 through 29, for the sake of time, I'm not going to do that. But it says this, and you should witness it. It says, it was a darkness that could be felt. A darkness that could be felt. Some think it was a sandstorm. But the Bible has been very clear in its descriptions that this was a supernatural event that lasted for three days. And yet the Pharaoh continues to make his concessions. Okay, some more of you can go, but not your flocks and your herds. I'll do this. And what I noticed in this whole account today as we look at the power of God is how patient God is with us. And I thought we, we must not move past that, that when we continually have hardened hearts, what a patient God we have. That's good news for us. Amen. What a patient God we have. But he's not a pushover. Plague number 10, the death of the firstborn. It is a declaration of war against Osiris, the giver of life, and against the Pharaoh himself, who was considered a deity and tasked with so many things that he should be able to provide this for you. If you read in Exodus 11, verses 1 through 9, you will read all that God was doing here. But I want to just begin with this and uh, guys who are operating the computer and stuff, I want you to jump down to verse 4 with me. So Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even of the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor will ever be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And if we stopped right there, I want you to notice this. As we read this account, there is no celebration. We do not celebrate the plagues. We just simply don't. We don't celebrate the plagues. If you have any misgivings about this passage that somehow we are to love chaos and that we are to love destruction is to miss the point of this passage. We are to celebrate something in the midst of this. The bottom line is this. We are to celebrate the power of God displayed for his glory and our benefit. Would you get that again? Let me say it because I, I, I must get it for you. We are to celebrate the power of God displayed for his glory and our benefit. Worship team, I'm going to invite you to come. And as they come, I want you to hear this as we close out this morning. 
and this final account, this final plague, there's something to be revealed to us. It was to reveal the great lengths that the Son of God would go in order to secure our freedom. Think about it this way. Jesus, the firstborn. Jesus, the firstborn Son of Heaven, would willingly die. Not have his life taken from him. He would willingly die his life for ours. The plague of God's wrath would fall against sin on him. It would be poured out on Jesus instead of us. He would not compromise. He would not make a deal. He would obey his father completely. We do not celebrate the death of Pharaoh's son. We do not celebrate the plagues. We celebrate with great thanksgiving in our hearts for Jesus. First, for living the perfect life that we could not live. And then dying in our place and rising again after three days to give us new life. To which we say, glory to God in the highest. Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you be ready to sing and celebrate? This is what we're to do. Glory to God.
out this week. Let's be reminded of how great our God is. Thank you so much for hanging out this morning. Make sure you uh, stay tuned in this week if there's some encouraging words from Jason. Make sure you're awesome.